spirit with them, even in the week ahead. Lord, I pray that you would now teach us from your word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through it by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us strength, grace for the week ahead. And Lord, we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You can have a seat. Thanks, music team. I like standing right up front when we sing because I hear your voices raised together coming to the forward at the front of the room. I love it. All right, well, if you'll open your Bibles to Jonah, if you or, uh, you know, page on your iPhones to Jonah, however you want to do that. Um, We are starting a new series going through this little prophetic book. Um, Now, when most people who have kind of a history in the church or who who are familiar with the Bible in some ways, think about the book of Jonah, I think the first picture that comes to their minds is a a bit of a comical, almost cartoonish one. Um, It's one of the first... uh, Bible stories that uh, a lot of children learn in Sunday school. Obviously, this this amazing tale of a prophet uh, who is literally swallowed by a giant fish. Uh, So there's almost a a cartoonish element to our first thoughts about uh, Jonah. But I do think that this is a book, as we'll see hopefully over the next few weeks, that has a lot to teach us about the heart of God. What is the heart of God actually like? What is his desire for the world and the people that he's created. And then number two, what must our hearts be like as followers of this God? Uh, We're doing this series, I'm teaching this series very intentionally as we consider our own role as proclaimers of this great gospel message that we have received. And I love that we sang, Oh Church Arise. It could be an anthem almost for this series. A call to rise up, and embrace the heart of God, his heart, to extend his mercy and his salvation everywhere to all people who will repent and believe in his son, Jesus Christ. So that's why we're doing Jonah. We're going to do four weeks in Jonah uh, this week, next week. Then we'll be off for a couple weeks for spring break. Can you believe we're two weeks away from spring break? Unbelievable. Uh, We'll come back and finish Jonah 3 and 4, and then we'll do three weeks in Nahum. Uh, this little study prophet that actually has an interesting connection to the prophet Jonah, which we'll talk about more uh, in the coming weeks. Now, what I want to do this morning, we don't always do this when we dive into a certain book of the Bible, uh, but in this case, I think it's important. I want to say a few words as we begin our study of the book of Jonah on some of the critical issues, that is, the literary criticism that surrounds the book of Jonah. You need to be aware, as you come to a book like Jonah, that critical scholarship today, particularly in more liberal circles, almost entirely rejects the book of Jonah as a historical work. Uh, They would see it, for example, as a post-exilic fable that is written by some Jewish people uh, after the return from exile, uh, trying to make a certain point, but actually having nothing to do with a real historical person or a real historical call of God on this person's life. But I want to, uh, well, let me say one more thing on that. If that's true, if Jonah is not a historical person and this is not a historical narrative work, then any conclusions about God's heart for the nations, God's missionary heart for all peoples in the Old Testament that we might want to draw from this book are nullified. They're made totally irrelevant if this is not a true (laughs) historical work about one man and God's call in his life. So we can't draw any conclusions. All we can do is evaluate why the post-exilic Jewish community might have wanted to write a book like Jonah. But I believe this book is true history, a real account, and I want to give you three reasons why. Number one, the genre of Jonah is the genre of historical narrative. Yes, it's a prophetic book, but it is written in such a way that the author assumes that we understand he's writing a real historical narrative account. Uh, It's written as a straightforward historical account. Now, it's true that there aren't a lot of historical details to the story of Jonah, 
But this probably means that the author wants you to focus on what's most important in the account of Jonah. So the genre is straightforward historical narrative. That's reason number one why I think this is a true historical work. Number two is the history of interpretation in the church. Now, this obviously doesn't in and of itself prove that Jonah is a historical work. But I do think it's noteworthy that until about the last 150 to 200 years of interpretation, every uh, biblical scholar of any account accepted Jonah as a straightforward historical narrative. So it wasn't until about 1850, 1860 that literary scholarship started to question the fact that Jonah might be a real account. We need to take that seriously. That means men like Augustine, and then Calvin and Luther in the Reformation, as well as the early church fathers in the first few centuries, <laughs> took this to be a real historical work. I think we need to take that seriously. Number three, though, is for me the kicker. Uh, it's that Jesus himself, in the New Testament, takes this as a real historical account about a real historical person who has a call on his life from God. So let me just point you to two passages. We'll turn there. Uh, I won't belabor this too much longer. First of all, Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 41. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 41. And here's what, uh, what Jesus says. Some of the scribes and the Pharisees, here's the context, they answered him saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So you see he's talking about this as if it is truly a real historical account. Then verse 41, the men of Nineveh, that is the men of Nineveh who repent and ultimately believe the message of Jonah, will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So you see Jesus' take on this little prophetic work. And then a similar passage in Luke 11, Luke 11, 29 to 32. If you'll turn over there, Luke 11, 29 to 32. And it's very similar. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. He talks about the Queen of the South. And then he says in verse 32, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented of the preaching of Jonah. Behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So two times we have recorded for us in the Gospels by Matthew and by Luke. Jesus' take on this as a true historical account. So I want you to know that as we begin this series together, your pastor takes this not only as God's inspired word, but also as a truly historical account of what actually took place. And as such, I think we can then draw conclusions and applications about God, about his love for his people, and about his call on our lives today as we, like Jonah, need to have our hearts more and more conformed to the heart of our Savior. Uh, one more word on this before we get into the text. The authorship of Jonah is tough. It's a difficult issue. Uh, I have a strong opinion on the authorship of Jonah. I'm going to save it for Jonah chapter 4, but I'll say this today. Whoever wrote Jonah has intimate knowledge of the details of Jonah's account. And I think that counts for a lot, but we'll come back to that in Jonah chapter 4. Here, here's the theme of the book of Jonah, I think, if you want to jot this down. It's the heart of God for all peoples of the world. That's the theme of Jonah, that God is a God who has a heart for all peoples of the world to know him, and also the sinful hearts of his people that often get in the way of God's heart for all people. So God's heart for all people, <coughs> but then the sinful hearts of his own people that sometimes get in the way. And we are going to see the story in Jonah of the most reluctant gospel minister ever, but also the most insistent God 
forever. He's a God who will keep going after people like the Ninevites, and he will go after his own prophet, Jonah, in the process, changing and forming and reshaping his heart in order to bring his salvation and his grace to lost sinners. So with that, I want to get into the text together. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll go through this text. Uh, I want you to see the narrative, the way that the writer is putting this together for us, and then we'll draw a couple applications uh, at the end. So first of all, in verses 1 to 2, Jonah chapter 1, 1 to 2, you see the word of the Lord coming to this man, Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. Now, who is Jonah? Uh, you don't need to turn here, but we read in 2 Kings chapter 14 that he is a prophet during the reign of Jeroboam II in Israel. So he's in the northern kingdom. He is a real historical figure. He ministered during the reign of this king, Jeroboam. And he gets this simple message from God. It's basically a warning of coming judgment. Call out against the city of Nineveh. Uh, God calls the city of Nineveh that great city, that huge or significant city. That's an adjective that's used to describe Nineveh 14 times in the book. It's meant to alert the readers, to alert us of the significance of this city. We'll talk more about it in a minute. Um, and let me just stop here and say um, that this proclamation of evil, this warning of judgment, is actually the beginning of any message of good news of God's salvation to people. In other words, it's the bad news that Jonah is called by God to bring to the people of Nineveh that has to come before they get the good news. You have to get the diagnosis of cancer before you are called to do chemotherapy. That's what Jonah is bringing to the people of Nineveh, or what Jonah is called to bring to the people of Nineveh. It's the diagnosis that their evil has now come up to God, who's been patient for years and years and years, and now is about to bring judgment upon them because of their sin. Now, here's the first application, even from these first two verses. We're beginning to see that God has a heart for the nations. Even in the Old Testament, God has a missionary heart for Gentile pagan people to turn to him. He wants to show mercy to lost sinners everywhere. It's amazing. Well, look at verse 3. You know Jonah's response if you're familiar with this book says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Now, you can see the, the repetition of the author. He uses that phrase, away from the presence of the Lord, twice. The other interesting thing about this is that if you look at where Tarshish is on the map from Nineveh, it's exactly the opposite direction. So this is not just veering off, you know, from the will of God for his life. This is going the exact opposite direction from what God asked him to do. It's spitting in the face of God. And, and our immediate response is to say, okay, Jonah, this is utterly stupid. Like, really, Jonah? You really think you're going to get away with this? But I want to think for a moment about Jonah's reasoning as he does this. So he's been called by God to bring a word to Nineveh. So I want to think for a minute about Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. That was one of the great world powers of Jonah's age. Um, uh, it would have been um, certainly a foe of Israel, although during Jonah's time, they don't pose a real threat to Israel. They've actually had a period, Israel has, of relative success. Assyria is probably occupied fighting different battles in other regions during this time. And nevertheless, Jonah is probably acquainted with some of the atrocities of the Assyrians and the men of Nineveh. A violent people, a people bent on conquest, conquest certainly a people um, involved in idol worship and different kinds of uh, immorality. Perhaps Jonah's even seen their work firsthand. And his response, which makes him try to go the opposite way from God, is founded on the fact that he thinks there's no way people like that should receive mercy from God. And that becomes clearer more as we get later into the book. But there's no way that people like the Ninevites, according to Jonah, should receive mercy. And I want to stop there and ask you to put yourself in the shoes of Jonah. 
I want you to think about the worst person you can think of or the worst group of people you can think of and consider being called by God to bring them a message of mercy or a message of warning for the sake of their salvation. I think probably in some ways the closest parallel in our current situation might be ISIS. That's probably close to the association that Jonah would have in his mind with the Ninevites, part of the Assyrian Empire. These are people who are against what we are about as the people of God in every way possible. They're violent, they commit atrocities, they're bent on conquest, and they reject everything that our belief in God is all about. Really, God? You're calling me to go to them? Amazing. And so he goes the other way. And let me just say here on this that we, like Jonah, can so easily despise God's mercy to others. I think Jonah has racism going on here. I think he's got ethnocentrism going on here. God's mercy is for the Jewish people, not for other peoples. And I think we too struggle sometimes with the idea that some sins seem worse than others. Well, God can forgive my sin my little suburban sin in my Christian community, but some sins seem much worse. And here's the fundamental problem for Jonah and sometimes for us, is that we forget who we are in the eyes of God. We forget that we are recipients of God's grace as well. And for Jonah, we need to remember that he wasn't getting anything totally new from God here. It's not like God was introducing a totally out of the blue new concept. So actually, up to this point throughout the Old Testament, God has already demonstrated to his people time and time again that he has a heart not only for Israelites, not only for ethnically Jewish people, but for all the nations of the world. So think about, for example, God's first call to Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Remember God's promise to Abraham, I'll make of you a great nation, I will bless you, and then what's the third part? In you, all the nations or all the families of the earth will be blessed. So in the call of the first Jew, there's a promise of blessing to that Jew and also through him to everybody all over the world. Fundamental to the first call of Abraham. Uh, when, when the Israelites are called out of Egypt by God, the part that we often forget is that a lot of the Egyptians actually joined in with them. And they left Egypt as the people of God as a mixed multitude ethnically mixed multitude. We forget that shortly after that, in the conquest of Jericho, there was a Gentile prostitute named Rahab who was actually invited to join the people of God and became the great-grandmother of David himself. So God has already set the standard for his people of including people outside the covenant who receive him by faith and want to be accepted in. Jonah shouldn't have been utterly surprised by this call that God gave to him. Well, anyway, look at verses 4 to 6. Uh, God hurls a storm um, at Jonah as he's trying to run the other direction. It says, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. That's the same word, by the way, that will be used later. Same Hebrew word that's used for the sailors hurling Jonah into the sea. Uh, it's just great storytelling, great Hebrew story storytelling. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. There was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. They hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Now, it's an incredibly ironic section that starts here in this chapter of Jonah. Um, what I think the author is doing here, and he'll do again in the next section, is he's contrasting the behavior of the sailors with Jonah. So look at the sailors again. They're praying to their gods. Uh, they're trying to help each other. And then Jonah, the Jewish prophet, who's a follower of the true God, supposedly is asleep. Now on that point, let me just suggest something to you. We often think that when people sin, whether it's believers or unbelievers, they will be immediately tormented by that sin and unable to rest until they repent. 
It's not Jonah's case, is it? <laughs> he's literally going the opposite way from God, rejecting the word of God, and he's asleep. There are times when we can be, at least for a period of time, content in our sin. We can't only appeal to feelings to call people out of sin or ourselves. So Jonah's content with his sin. He's sleeping as all of the sailors are running around trying to help, but God isn't going to let him get away with this. I want to read verses 7 to 15 now. Um, I know it's a big chunk, but as I read it, I want you to see how ironic it is that the sailors themselves, these pagan Gentile sailors who know nothing of God, are actually way more noble than Jonah, who's the Hebrew prophet from God's covenant people. So starting in verse 7. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? And of what people are you? And Jonah answers verse 9 with what I think is kind of a trite, rehearsed, thoughtless expression of who he is, which he's probably said hundreds and hundreds of times. I think he said it something like this. I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. It's a trite uh, way of identifying himself, although there's so much substance there in what he actually says. And then look at verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So it's incredibly ironic. Even Jonah's own, own words bear test testimony to the fact that the God he worships is the God of the sea. The very sea that he's trying to use to run away from that God. And the sailors are the ones who get terrified they believe in the power of this unknown God even more than Jonah does. And then look at verse 11. They do everything they can to save him. These are noble men in many ways. They said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me that this great tempest has, become, has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord. Again, their nobility, uh, uh, they're blameless. They're, they're asking to be blameless on account of this man's life. Oh, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him, that word, into the sea, and the sea ceased. From its raging. So you see these sailors do everything they can to avoid throwing Jonah in, uh, sacrificing his life for theirs, but ultimately they have to. And Jonah, in the midst of it, seems kind of resigned to his fate. It's my fault that this is happening. Throw me in. You'll be okay. At this point, I think we should read Jonah, understand Jonah as just wanting to die. Well, verse 16, and we'll end with, with this verse. I think what you see in verse 16 is the very first conversion in the book of Jonah. Look at 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceeding, exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So three things that the author tells us these men do. Number one, they fear the Lord greatly. Lord, that is Yahweh. It's the, the word for the Hebrew God. Uh, number two, they sacrifice to the Lord. Number three, they make vows to the Lord. They promise to serve him. Now, the reasons I think this is genuine conversion, a lot of people don't think these men are genuinely, genuinely giving themselves to God in faith. Three reasons I think this is conversion. Number one, because Jonah, in the process of the storm, has explained to these men who his God is, right? Even though he doesn't mean it in that moment, he's explained to them, I follow Yahweh. I follow the one true God, the creator, the one who rules both heaven and earth, earth and the sea. So he's told them who the God is that's hurling this storm on their ship. Number two, they've seen this God's power. So they've seen the way that the God of Israel has power to, to, to uh, bring a storm onto their ship, even outside of the land of Israel. He's not a localized deity. He's obviously the God of all the earth. And then number three, their response, which we just read about, 
they respond exactly the way people always do throughout the Bible when they genuinely fear God and turn to him. They make sacrifices, they fear him, and they make vows. And so to the critics who would say this isn't genuine conversion, they're just incorporating Yahweh into their kind of pantheon of deities, I would say, what more are you looking for? I think this is conversion. And here's the point. Everywhere we look in this book, everywhere we look in the book of Jonah, pagan Gentiles are coming to faith. Everywhere we look, God's bringing people to himself that are outside of the covenant people of Israel. And there's huge implications about the heart of God and the long reach of God's mercy into people's lives. And Jonah, in the midst of it, this Israelite prophet, this prophet from the covenant people of God, is sullen, and he's bitter, he's uninterested, and he's just ready to die. Incredibly ironic. Well, let me ask you two questions. I know we need to wrap up, and we're going to sing together a couple more songs. First question, based on this first chapter of Jonah. Do you see, do you understand, do you know the heart of your God? The heart of God that's demonstrated in this call on Jonah's life, in his heart for the people of Nineveh, in his heart even for these pagan sailors who get converted as Jonah's running away from his mission to Nineveh. Do you get that the God you serve, the God who saved you, is immensely merciful, is patient, <coughs> Uh, Peter in the New Testament says that one reason that Jesus has not yet returned to judge the world is that God is patient. This is 2 Peter chapter 3. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's the heart of God. A long reach of mercy that he desires all people everywhere to turn to him. And then number two, based on that, once you've seen God's heart, how does your heart line up with the heart of your God? How does your heart line up with the heart of your God? The God who is intensely committed to showing his mercy to people who are outside of his covenant currently, outside the church, outside of the Christian community. In other words, are we, along with God, embracing this vibrant gospel witness to everybody? Or are we, like Jonah, content to hold it to ourselves, thinking that we are somehow more privileged than other people, even people who we might naturally despise? Well, I think this book is going to call us to a commitment to share the gospel totally indiscriminately, because that's the heart of our God. And when his son finally enters the world, the offer of salvation is to everyone everywhere who will look on him repent and believe and lay down their lives to follow him. That's what Jonah needs to learn and we'll see what happens as the book goes on. Let me pray. We're going to sing a couple more songs together. Lord God, we think about uh, when you revealed yourself to Moses in Exodus as the Lord, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, I pray that we would see your heart. Lord, those of us who um, have grown up in Christian homes may need to be reminded of how far we fall from your holiness and your perfection, how much we needed to be redeemed. That the blood of Jesus Christ was necessary for our salvation just as much as it is necessary for a murderer or someone who's done unspeakable evil. Lord, help us to see your heart for lost people. And Lord, I pray that you would convict us in the coming weeks of the ways that we hold back from sharing the, the good news of the gospel willingly, openly, passionately, without any discrimination. And so I pray that we would find ourselves more and more lining up with the heart of our God. And we pray that for the sake of your Son and his glory in your world. Amen.
let's stand. Uh, this next song we're going to sing is called Scandal of Grace. Verse 2 says, Death, where is your sting? Your power is as dead as my sin. The cross has taught me to live, and mercy my heart now to sing. So let's sing of that grace. Amen. Um. 